I'm very thankful again to be able to be with you this week and appreciate the invitation of the elders. I've been very encouraged already by the good worship service and everyone who has led, directed our minds toward Christ and toward all those things that uh, we are striving after this morning. I want to begin this morning and we will continue asking this question and observing some things, but I want to ask you if I had the power to grant you one wish, anything that you want, what would you ask for? What would you want more than anything else? I would expect that if you had enough time, most, if not all of us here, would express that, well, I, you know, when it comes right down to it, more than anything else, I want to go to heaven and be with God for eternity. If, if we miss that, we've missed everything. But you know, sometimes we might speak about things that we want, but we're not, we don't really want those bad enough to do what it takes to get there, you know. Uh, maybe you, if you've watched an athlete, uh, you know, in, uh, an NBA player, maybe on the, on the collegiate level, and, and you think, man, I, w- I just wish I could play like that. Do you? Yeah, would you be willing to do what it takes to, to get to that, that level of expertise? Uh, uh, maybe somebody who, old enough to remember Muhammad Ali uh, fighting, you know, uh, float like a butterfly, and, and you think, man, I'd... Uh, that, that guy was just impressive, you know, incredible. Well, you know, there, there's some things you've got to do in order to, order to get there. And, th- and that's the way that it is with, with just about everything in life, isn't it? It takes a great deal of work, and some people are blessed with a, a great deal of talent in a certain area, but still there has to be a lot of work that's put in in order to get there. When we talk about wanting to go to heaven more than anything else, I want to challenge you with this follow-up question, and that is, are you willing to do what it takes to get there. Do you value it more than anything else? You know, when a young man wants a young woman's hand in marriage, he makes that his primary focus. He will go to any length, he'll jump over the moon to win her heart. Or take, for instance, an athlete who wants to win a state championship or play on a collegiate or Olympic level. He's willing to put in the time, and as we talked about in the first hour this morning, to forego some liberties in order to accomplish that. A musician who wants to play on the big stage, or a scholar who seeks to be a valedictorian. There's a certain amount of sacrifice and effort that needs to be put into that. And so I ask again, are you willing to do anything that it takes in order to get there? And if you really do want that more than anything else, What if I could tell you of a way to obtain that with more certainty, with more surety? You'd certainly implement that, wouldn't you? I believe I can do that, and and, and I want you to turn to the passage. It's already been read a couple of times this morning. It is the text of our study this morning, and it's in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, I want you to notice, beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I want to suggest to you that that is the key. This is a pearl in the scriptures that really enlightens us as to what it's going to take to actually get there. We know that there is a scheme, there's been a plan that God has has planned since before the beginning of time to redeem sinful man back to himself. And there are certain things that we've got to do in order to be a part of that elect. We've got to believe, we've got to confess our faith, repent of our sins, and be baptized in water for the remission of sins. But as we spoke about this morning, that's not the end of salvation, it's the beginning end, it's not the end end. And so we spend the rest of our life walking by faith and not by sight. And how is it that we get there? There was a time in my life, in in my early 20s, coming out of college, working in secular work down the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I was a single man living away from my family, away from my parents, attending uh, services and uh, worshiping there in Irving, Texas. And I remember thinking, Why is it so hard to be a Christian? 
Why is it so difficult? Because it, it seems like I would, I would do well for a while and then I would just fall off the wagon and, and struggle and flounder for a while and then I would come back and I would do well for a while and, and then it wasn't long and I was giving in again. And, and why was that, that constant cycle happening to me? I couldn't understand it. And it wasn't until, again, one of those passages that I've read so many times, I'd heard over and over again but I'd never really plumbed the depths of it. Listening to the Bible, an audio version on a cassette tape in my truck, and it came across this passage, and as it was read, I stopped it, and I thought, that's it. That's why it's been so hard for me to consistently live this life glorifying Christ. And it is precisely because I haven't been willing to lay aside every weight. And that's why I haven't been able to run with endurance, because that's what it was all about. When I was asking, why is it so hard to be a Christian? What I meant was, why don't I have the endurance to keep on? Why, why am I not as consistent as other Christians that I see? And this is what it was all about. This I want to suggest to you this morning, and we'll look more at it this afternoon, is the key. So if you want to go to heaven more than anything else, are you willing to lay aside every weight? And we talk about laying aside every weight. I want you to realize that what the Holy Spirit is talking about here is not necessarily things that are sinful. We've got to put off the old man. We, we've, got to get, we've got to leave behind those things that were a part of our old life. That's what repentance is. That's what putting off the old man is. But there's more than that. When he's talking about laying aside every weight, he says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So sin is, a, is another thing. And I believe the sin that he talks about that so easily ensnares us in the context of the book of Hebrews is a sin of unbelief for whatever it's worth. But laying aside every weight is talking about hindrances, things that are not inherently sinful, but that weigh us down, that exhaust us spiritually. I believe the New American Standard Version says every encumbrance. I like that translation. It is that idea of things that are not necessarily sinful, but things that are not helpful. We might use the word expedient. They're not expedient to getting to heaven. 1 Corinthians 6 speaks about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 12, he says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. He's talking about things that are lawful. Now, not everything is lawful, but he's talking about within the scope of things that are lawful. He said, not all of those things actually help. As a matter of fact, some of those things that are lawful can be a hindrance. That's what we were talking about in the first hour, wasn't it? Eating meat sacrificed to idols, lawful. Sometimes it wasn't helpful. When it, when it pertained to a, a brother, a Gentile, a new convert who was weak in his conscience, that was not a helpful thing to do. And so Paul is just making this, and, and he also addresses what we talked about. Don't let your liberty become your Lord. He said some of these things that are liberties that are lawful can actually bring us under their power. It's almost a, maybe it's a habitual, but maybe almost an addictive nature to some of these things that are not wrong in and of themselves. But when we come to crave them and fall down and serve them, now we've been brought under the power of these things and they are wrong just for that very reason. If I, if I were to give you a graph, a, a very uh, um, rough graph, if you will, what I, what I think he's showing us is that there is a realm of things that are unlawful, but that's not what he's talking about. Paul says within this scope and this realm of what is lawful, there are things that are helpful and there are things that are not helpful. Things that are expedient to getting to heaven and things that are not expedient. And he's dealing with those things in Hebrews 12 and in verse 1 that are not helpful. Lawful, but not helpful. And what he's revealing to us here is that if our desire really is to finish, then we're going to shed that weight. Look with me in Luke chapter, uh, uh, or actually uh, begin with me in Matthew chapter 10. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 37. 
Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Mother and father, son or daughter, those things are not sinful. But we've got to realize what comes first. It's about priorities. And sometimes our family relationships can actually be an albatross spiritually to us. Have you experienced that? A family member who is weighing you down, who is bringing you down spiritually. A family member who is actually toxic to your spiritual life and your walk with God. That can happen. You look in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 14. He says in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters. Yes, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. He's talking about loving God more. He's talking, he uses a, a form of hyperbole here to express the contrast between the love that we have for God and for all of the relationships. Things that are not inherently in and of themselves, but we've got to be willing to shed anything that is going to hinder getting to God. Yes, it's all about hindrance. There's a couple of metaphors used here. Run with endurance, the race that is set before us. Race in this text is a metaphor. A metaphor for all of the striving and the discipline and the effort of a Christian's life struggle to get to heaven. Weight is a metaphor for all the things of this life that drain our spiritual energy, that exhaust us, and that finally hinder us from finishing that's what it's all about. And I want us to realize that as we look at this, what we've got to understand, and this goes back to that Matthew 10 passage, mother and father and brother and sister. The real key is our desire. What is our desire? Is it to finish? That's the key. You see, because our desire is going to reveal what we truly value. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasure is not necessarily money. Treasure is anything you value. So he said, whatever you value, and that could be mother, father, daughter, or son, and we should value our parents, we should value our children, but not more than the Lord, not more than heaven. And there can be some temporal things that we value. We need to have the proper value for, for the work of another person or we borrow someone's tool. We need to have the proper value for that, but not more than the Lord, obviously. And so what the Lord's revealing to us is the greater the value, the more that our heart is there. So what is your greatest value? What is your greatest desire? You say, it is to get to heaven. Let's find out. We find out based upon where our energy goes, where our time, where our thinking is, what do you truly value? That's the key. And when our desire is to go to heaven, we're going to lay aside every weight if we really want to get there. You know, I've always used the, this, uh, this uh, illustration in this lesson. And, and by the way, that when I was talking about working in secular work, that was many years ago. I started preaching 30 years ago. But when I was working in secular work and, and, and going through this struggle, this passage was, was an epiphany to me. It, it, it made me realize this is what it's going to take. One of the first sermons that I preached when I began my preaching work was this sermon right here. It's the most personal sermon that I will ever preach because it outlines this journey of faith of coming out of this deception of thinking that as long as it's not wrong, I can do it and I can walk right up to the line. And still get to heaven. I was under that deception. And I had to understand that I've got to be willing to forego a lot of things that are liberties because they bring me under their power. And, and so when, when, I, when I, I was trying to think of it, what's an illustration to use? That the one that I came up with so many years ago is my, my brother at that time had just ran in a 10K in Fort Worth. And, and I'd, I'd gone down there to watch him run. And that's just not something that I do, by the way. But let's say, for instance, I, I was impressed with all those runners and, and running in that race. And, and let's say that this week there was a marathon uh, uh, here in the area, in the, in the greater Indianapolis area. 
And, and I told you, you know, uh, uh, tomorrow morning I'm going to be running in that marathon. He's kidding? I didn't know a preacher running a marathon. I, I had to go down there and see this. And so you, you show up at the race and you see me, I'm down there warming up right at the starting line. And, and you notice that I've got this big five gallon water jug on my shoulder. And you, and you might walk down there and say, bro, what are you, what are you doing? Why, why are you carrying that water jug? I said, well, 26 miles a long ways. I'm going to, I'm going to get thirsty and, and I'm going to need some water with me. And you might express to me, well, yeah, Brett, everybody gets thirsty running, but you know, there's going to be some water stations along the way. And if you carry that jug full of water, I mean, most people run this race just to see if they can finish, not even to win. If you put that much weight on you, you're going to exhaust yourself. You're probably not going to finish. I, I want to ask you this. What would you think if I said, I've looked at the rules and it's not against the rules and I like my water and I'm going to carry this water jug. I would reveal to you that I value getting a drink when I'm thirsty more than I value finishing the race. I mean, that's the bottom line. If you know anything about running 26 miles, that's the bottom line. And my point is this, that Sometimes we're so focused on what is right and what is wrong as if everything in being a Christian is a binary question. It's either right or it's wrong. There are things that are right. There are things that are wrong. But among those things that are right, there are some things like that water jug that are exhausting us spiritually and we may not finish. And if we are determined to hold on to those things, then we're showing that we don't really want to get to heaven more than anything else. Yes, this is what it comes down to. What is your desire? You know, we read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul said that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. I want you to look with me for the remainder of the time this morning and then this afternoon at some things that I identified in my life that were weights that were a hindrance to me. And I believe that this is a pretty universal issue for many of us as Christians. What are some things that are not inherently sinful, but that weigh us down? One of the first things that I identified in my life was this desire for worldly success. When I say worldly, I don't mean worldly in the sense of immoral. I just mean temporal, not eternal. (laughs) Things that are temporal. I'm talking about essentially being great in God's mind or in man's eyes, being great in the estimation of men, to have people of this world to say, wow, you've arrived, you've made it, you've really done it. And that was something that I did desire. Coming out of high school, going into college, I saw these people were successful. I I thought, I can do that. This is how you do this. There was, that, there was enough of that competitiveness, that enough, enough of that work ethic trained uh, growing up on a farm that I, I can do that. I can outwork this guy. And there's nothing wrong with that. God wants us to be a hard worker. Yes, that's certainly true. There's nothing wrong with worldly success. But when we have a desire to be great in the estimation of men, we've got to ask ourselves, Is that competing with our desire to be great in the estimation of God? Because they're not always the same thing. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. That's God's estimation of greatness. Verse 44, And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That runs completely counter to the world's idea of success and greatness, does it not? You you see how this desire for worldly acclaim can put us many times in conflict with what God wants us to do to succeed? In John chapter 5, Jesus would ask the Jews, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? They were more concerned about how they were honored by men. And when Jesus said, how can you believe? Remember in John chapter 12 and in verse 42, it says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Listen to verse 43. For they loved the praises of men more than the praise of God. That doesn't mean that they didn't love the praise of God. Remember where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
That's where it led them to. And young people, I want you to realize that this is what you're going to be led to if your primary focus is this worldly acclaim, is success in the eyes of the world. Nothing wrong with being successful at what you do. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. But not ever at the cost of serving God. That's what this is about. And the problem, you say, well, I, I never have any intent of doing that. We never do. It just happens, doesn't it? Subtly, slowly, we're working more hours. We're more and more devoted to our career. In order to get that next move up or that next promotion, that next raise, we're going to have to put in just a little bit more time. It's okay. Just a little bit more. I, 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 can, I can spend that little bit more and I'll be all right. And eventually I'll retire and then I'll, I'm going to devote all my time to the Lord. We have all these ways of rationalizing. The bottom line is we're slowly but surely choosing some temporal things over our full devotion to God. Uh, this, this really, around that same time that this came to light for me, there was a gospel meeting there in Irving, Texas, and the preacher was from West Texas, and a brother named Wayne Partain, been very active in the, in the Spanish-speaking work for many years. And I remember in one of his sermons, he was talking about this issue of being great in God's mind or in man's estimation, and he, he expressed to us that the greatest man he had ever known in the kingdom of God was a janitor at an elementary school in Midland or Odessa, Texas. He said that that man had led more people to Christ by leaving tracts and bathrooms, and talking to people about their soul, inviting people to church. As far as his career, probably no one would remember him. But Brother Partain said that this was the greatest man he had ever known in service to God. This is what it means, is that, that there is a difference in what the world sees as great and what God sees as great. And this is all about what is God priority for me? You say, well, God says I'm to provide for my family, 1 Timothy 5 and 8, and, and if I don't, I'm worse than an infidel. That's exactly right. No doubt about that. But you know, in Ephesians 4 and in verse 28, he said, let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good that he may have to give to him who does not have. It's not about success, is it? It's about providing those things that are needed. And, and in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, you might remember there in verse 12, where the apostle Paul would say, and they... Uh, he says, now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Yes, we are to work, but that's a far cry from being consumed with this success, from working these long hours, from forsaking the assembly, neglecting a, a wife or, or children in order to a, attain to this success. And that's why this is a weight. It is a weight because we may have to lose worldly success in order to remain faithful to God. In Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 22, Jesus said, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Then in verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Jesus said, be like me. There was a time when they wanted to make Jesus a king, but boy, that turned around real fast, didn't it? All those people who wanted to make him a king were saying, crucify him. And he said, don't be surprised if that happens to you. And, you're, and if that is your primary goal, you're going to be wrecked. You're going to be devastated. Why is it that some Christians do so well and then when some great difficulty comes in their life, they lose something tremendously valuable to them? They, they lose their job or, or there's a change in the economy or maybe they, they lose a loved one and all of a sudden their faith just crumbles. What's going on? Their, their value was probably not in the right place. You know, Paul made this statement in the book of Philippians in chapter 3. He said, all the things that I used to consider as gain, as valuable, 
I've counted all of these laws for the cause of Christ. You know, there's some things we value and some things we don't. My wife decorates the house with a lot of things that I'd be fine if we sold them. If you put towels in the bathroom that you can't use, I've never understood that. But she values those things, see? And there's some things that, that we may value at one time, and Paul says we've got to learn to count those as things that we would gladly lose. And when we value the right thing, when it's taken away, we're okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Beginning in verse 11, Paul said, To the present hour we both hunger and thirst. We're poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. We labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Verse 13, being defamed, we entreat. We've been made as the filth of the world, as the offscouring of all things until now. And in verse 16, he says, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. This was an ambassador of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, an ambassador. When I think of an ambassador, I think of Henry Kissinger, you know. I mean, now that, that, that was a prestigious man, you know. This was an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and he said, here's what the world thinks of us. We're like the offscouring of this world to them. And you need to be like me. That's what it's all about. We've got to be willing to give it up. When it comes to losing it, we've got to be willing to lose it. And when we think about Daniel, Daniel had it all. As a, as a prisoner, he had risen to great authority. And it was all going to be taken away from him if he prayed to God. And knowing the decree had been signed, he prayed to God. He counted it loss. Moses counted all things loss. He walked away from all the wealth and the riches and the fame of Egyptian power in order to walk with God. And Paul was willing to do the same thing. Again, let me emphasize, it is not wrong to be successful in the estimation of men. In the book of Proverbs, in chapter 27, verse 23 through 24, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. Be a good steward. There's nothing wrong with being successful. Abraham was successful. Job was successful. The danger is in the desire. You see, those men like Abraham, their desire was to serve God. Their desire was to be right with God, and God made them successful. He made them wealthy. And, and the danger is in the desire because if you desire, if you crave success in the estimation of men, then you're going to want to hold on to it. I'll tell you another thing about this. Worldly success is intoxicating and is deceiving. Everybody wants just a little bit more. And you may be comparing yourself to other people at work saying, well, I'm, I'm not as bad as they are. You know, the Bible has something to say about comparing ourselves with ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says we become fools when we do that. We're not to compare ourselves with the people that we work around. We're to compare ourselves to Christ. It's all about priority. And, and so, yes, God requires that we work. But that doesn't mean that we have to have all of this worldly acclaim in order to accomplish that. We fulfill, what is God's priority for me? I need to take care of that first. I may still be able to do some other things. You know, I provide for my family as a gospel preacher. And, and, and I am supported to uh, fully to preach the gospel. In other words, it's a full-time job for me. You know, I'm able to do some other things. I can have some animals. I, I can do some woodwork. I, I, I can, the, the recreation, hobbies, there's other things I can do. But never to the detriment of my responsibility in my full-time job and providing for my family. It's about God's priorities. And I want to say that this is also a challenge for women today. You know, more and more as society has changed, women are being pressured to follow the world's standards of success. Women are told and have been for some time now that if they don't have a career and if they don't have this, this worldly acclaim, if, they, if they're not praised by the world for the work that they do, if they don't make as much money as their husband, then they just haven't found themselves. That, that there's no way that they're going to be able to, to have the, the self-esteem and, and the, the security that they need to have unless they go out and have a career in this particular way. 
What we've got to get back to again is God's priority. God's priority for the man and God's priority for the woman. In other words, God says, this is what you do first. And just like when I was talking about worldly success, I'm not saying that it's wrong for a woman to have a job, for a woman to make money outside of the home. I'm not saying that that's inherently sinful. But we've got to make sure that we know what the priority is. What is God's priority for the woman? It is to be a homemaker, a homekeeper. Titus chapter 2 and in verse 4, that the older women admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good and obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. What are they to be encouraged to do? To be homemakers. That's the priority. Paul said in 1 Timothy 5 and in verse 14, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. This is the priority. So yes, there are other things that can be done, provided the first things are done. When we're talking about a priority of God, it's not just a matter of getting her done. It's a matter of doing it well, is it not? That's my role as a father, as a husband, as a provider. My priorities, do it well. Do all things well. And so that's what we've got to ask ourselves, not whether or not it's right or it's wrong for a woman to work outside the home or, or to, to stay in the home. We've got to ask, are the priorities being met? Because that's more what it's about. And in order to understand this priority, we've got to go back to the beginning. Why was the woman created? You know, this sermon is probably the most politically incorrect sermon that I'll preach. I can preach on instrumental music or the plan of salvation. I won't make near as many people mad as I will with this. But brethren, the fact that society's changing doesn't mean that our preaching needs to change. We've got to preach what the Word of God says about our roles, about gender and about the roles of gender, regardless of what the world says around us. God said in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. That was the purpose for woman's creation, to be man's helper, suited for him, juxtaposed, to be, to be that perfect complement to the man. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 9, for man is not from the woman, but woman from man, nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Young ladies, before all other things, if you want to be fulfilled in life, God created you primarily for this purpose. Fulfill that purpose. Fulfill that role. And you will have the, the self-security and the self-esteem that so many successful women are still craving and it's a big hole in their life because they have not submitted to the role that God created them for. That's what it's about. And that's what we've got to come back to. This is the purpose that God gives us. That doesn't mean that a woman can't do something else. But what we've got to realize is that if God created us for a certain purpose, the genders are different. I don't, I don't care what everybody's saying about gender neutrality and all of that. That is, that's ridiculous. We are created different male and female, because we have different roles. And, be, and God created us to be suited to fulfill that role. That doesn't mean that I can't do something outside of that role every now and then. I can pitch in and help my wife with what she's so good at. I'm probably never going to be as good at it as she is. But she needs help sometimes and I need to help her. And that can go both ways. But you know, just because... You know, uh, uh, you take a, um, a running back in football. A running back can block, but he'll never block as good as a lineman, okay? <laughs> a quarterback can tackle, but he's never going to do it as well as some of those guys that that's their number one job. Have you ever had to use a screwdriver as a hammer? You know, I mean, if that's all you've got in your bag and you've got to hit something, but it's not near as good as a hammer, is it? What we've got to realize is that we can help and we can do other things. And, and that's not to say that women can't make as much money as men or they can't be as successful as men. What I'm saying is that as far as finding fulfillment and happiness in life, that's not where it's going to be found because 
until she fulfills her role as a homemaker. That's not going to be done. And the world is lying to, to our daughters and telling them that they're not going to be happy until they go out here and fulfill a role that God gave to men primarily. Brethren, this is something that is going to crush a lot of women. And older women need to be teaching this, and I say that because that's what the Bible says. The older women, that they admonish the young women to be discreet, chaste, and homemakers. And the reason that that's important is because, as I said, a lot of women are not going to hear this from me. It needs to come from the older women. And I've had older women say, well, Brett, I know, but, but they just don't want to hear that today. Well, bless your heart, they don't, people don't want to hear a lot of things I preach today. We're to be instant in season and out of season. Whether it's popular or not, we've got to teach these truths. Not that it's wrong for a woman to work outside the home, but that there is a priority that needs to be fulfilled just like there is for the man. And when that priority is fulfilled, there's other things that can be done. And I, let me say this, as far as being a homemaker and working outside the home, that priority is determined by the time and effort devoted to a task. This idea of quality work over quantity, that was created for people that wanted an out with devotion to their family. Husbands who were neglecting their families and they said, well, I know I don't get to spend a lot of time with the kids, but it'll be quality time. Why don't you try that with your boss? You want full-time pay, but you're going to work about 10, 15 hours a week. See if you'll buy that quality time over quantity. You know, there's a certain quantity that reveals priority. And so when, when a, a, a homemaker is working 45, 50 hours a week and she still has young children to care for and a home to guide, I'm not saying she can't do it, but it's going to be tough. There are a lot of women today that are weighed down, torn apart at the seams, crushed, trying to be super mom and pursue things that are not their responsibility. I know there can be certain circumstances that come up that would force that situation. It be an economic downturn or a husband who's injured. I, I'm, I realize there are a lot of reasons why that can be necessary. But husbands, what I'm seeing more and more is that wives are being pushed out into the workplace and forced to try to juggle both responsibilities because a lot of men have figured out that they can have a lot nicer toys if there's a dual income. They can drive a nicer truck. They can have that boat. They can go on those trips they want to go on. And a lot of men are forcing their wives out there. And while they may not be doing it outwardly, I want you to think about this, husbands. When all you talk about is women you're impressed with in the workplace and never praising your wife for her sacrifice and for her labor, then I'm telling you, there's not a woman at work that works as hard as what your wife does as a homemaker. When you're never praising that choice and that sacrifice, can you imagine why your wife is pushed to do something else? Uh, we've got to be valuing the right things. And this desire for worldly success is weighing down so many wives. And they, they just don't have the spiritual endurance because they're trying to do everything. Let us fulfill our roles. Men, let us teach our family to be content with such things as honest labor will provide. And let us praise our wives in the gates for the things that they do for the family. You know, when we think about this desire for worldly success, so many times it causes people to pursue their job at the cost of God. And, and people say, well, well, I'm going to, I'm going to give my time to God when I retire. In James 4 and verse 14, he said, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. When I was in secular work, I can't tell you how many men that I saw that talked about retirement, they went out and bought that fifth wheel or, or that vacation home. And in less than a year, they had cancer, heart attack. They never really got to enjoy it. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Does your job regularly cause you to miss the assemblies? We're not to forsake the assemblies of ourselves together as a matter of some is. Somebody will say, well, Brett, I, I know I've been missing. You know, my ox has been in the ditch. You know that passage in Luke 14 and verse 5? You know what Jesus was teaching there? 
pulling a, an ox or a donkey out of a pit. He was talking about saving life. He wasn't talking about a career. Don't misuse that passage. He's talking about saving a life on the Sabbath day. If you are scheduling yourself or taking a job where you know that you will habitually be missing the assembly of the saints together, don't tell me your ox is falling in the ditch. You know, I, we raised cattle when I was growing up. And sometimes we'd have a bull that was never content with his pasture or his cows. He's always tearing down the fence to get into another pasture. My dad called him a rogue bull. You know what we did with that bull? We killed him and we ate him and we got a different bull. If your ox is habitually falling in the ditch, you need to get another ox. There's something wrong with that ox. Do we have all kinds of rationalizations for putting our pursuits ahead of God? And the problem is that so many times we believe that there's going to be a time in the future, like I said, in retirement, when we're going to be able to fully devote our lives to God. We saw in James 4, 14, we don't know what will happen tomorrow. In Luke chapter 12, he says in verse 15, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke the parable to them about a certain rich man. The ground yielded plentifully. And in verse 18, he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I'll store all my crops and my goods and I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I've been weighed down and crushed by this desire. And I remember in secular work, only I was missing Sunday morning at first. I was able to get there for Sunday evening services. And then I started missing Wednesday evenings. The demand got higher. They needed me there more. And eventually, it became difficult to attend at all. And I wondered, why is it so hard to be a Christian? Well, it wasn't. I was exhausting myself spiritually trying to hang on to two things. It's like being the rope in a tug of war and getting pulled apart. And we're wondering, why is it so hard? It doesn't have to be so hard. Weight is hindrance. Is your desire to finish, to go to heaven, do you want that more than anything else? You've going to have, you're going to have to lay aside anything that is exhausting you spiritually. We're going to continue the study in the 4 o'clock hour. I've used up some extra time this morning. I appreciate your kind patience with me, but I don't want to leave here without extending the invitation of Jesus Christ. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, the greatest weight you'll ever carry is the weight of sin. And you can lay that aside, being obedient to the gospel, believing in him, confessing your faith in him, repenting of your sins, and being baptized in water for the remission of sins. And you can do that this morning before it's too late. We plead with you, don't put this off. Please, Come and make known your desire to obey the gospel. And if as a child of God, you've been weighed down and you want to get things right and you need our prayers, we'll pray with you and for you. But whatever your need is to be right with God, please come forward and make that known as we stand and sing the invitation song. Uh,